Have you ever wondered how things are made? It's something I wonder about all of the time when I buy antiques. Take this as an example. So I've just bought it for stock. It's a coopered jug, so handmade jug, brass and oak. It's a novelty jug, urn of some sort, but it's a stick stand ready to hold umbrellas, walking sticks, African tribal axes, whatever you want, you get the idea. It was made about 1900, so it's 120 years old, and it is extreme quality. Now, it's worth £250. Now, I think that's bonkers because I know this thing would cost an awful lot more to make. So, I began researching what goes into making a coopered item and how much it might cost today. And as luck would have it, I found local to me a chap called Alistair Sims. He is one of England's last master coopers and he works at a company in Ripon, North Yorkshire called Jensen's Cooperage. So I gave him a call and he's very happy to see me, very keen to see the jug and very happy to show you and I what goes in to making something like that. So come with me, I promise you it'll be fascinating. So Alistair, there it is. Tell me, what do you think? Oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's a good bit of kit. It is. Now, you will appreciate this, even though this is 120 years old. This is made in exactly the same way you make these things, isn't it? Yeah, Matt, what I'd make would be an exact copy. So down to shaping it and everything. So there's, there's a good two days work there. Is that how long it would take to make it? Yeah. Plus yeah. all your materials. Yeah. So you probably, in today's terms of money, you'd be probably looking at somewhere between 800 and a thousand pound well there you go it just goes to show that antiques really are very cheap they aren't are very they? cheap compared to having something bespoke made i mean yeah. there are, how many of you are there left in the country <clears throat> in the whole of the united kingdom yeah there's about 320 coopers working but in england itself there's uh, six of us just six yeah so where are the, where, where are the majority the majority are here in north yorkshire <laughs> but how come there's 300 in Britain? Because there's most of them in Scotland, but in England, the majority are in North Yorkshire. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Why? All the rest are in Scotland for the whiskey industry. Got you. Right. And North Yorkshire is obviously home for heritage brewing. Right. The Theakstons and Samuel Smiths. Is that where you started your career? I started mine at Tina Theakstons, yes. Right. Moved but you're on. a master cooper. Yeah. Is there, a, there must be a difference between a master cooper and a cooper. Yeah. What is that? In, in England. Yeah because it's different in Scotland. But in England, what it is, is when you come out of your time, you start as an apprentice, then you become a journeyman. And as a journeyman, you've got a right to take an apprentice. Right. Which I took. So when the apprentice comes out of his time, you go, f he becomes journeyman, you go from journeyman to master because you've trained somebody. Like the old fashioned days, somebody that's trained an apprentice. Well, this is the thing. It is an old fashioned trade. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Is it a dying out trade? Yeah, it is dying out, yeah. Shame, isn't it? And, this, and a lot of the skills, I mean, even in the whiskey industry, a lot of the skill sectors have, have been lost because they're just being taught to, to do the fast casts as they want them done. They're not taught how to make them or how to, you know, how to remake them or do anything like that in Scotland anymore. They're just totally taught, shown how to repair. And also production line manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do you do here then? Is this more bespoke? Yeah, we, we, we're in a nice situation it's still, I mean, we have got machines just to help us because I'm getting old, <laughs> <laughs> so I do need them. But this is, this is still old fashioned. So if we got an apprentice yeah. coming along for the first two years, he wouldn't be even allowed to use an electric drill or a battery operated drill. Right. He'd have to use a brace and bit. Right. So we learn them the old fashioned way of yeah. doing it by hand. And when I was an apprentice, I asked the question why. Yeah. And my old boss says, well, if we get a power cut, you can keep working and earn some money, can't you? But That's a good Yorkshire attitude, isn't it? <laughs> well, he comes from Staffordshire. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing if you're from Staffordshire. Yes. Now, let me talk to you about this one then. Right. Right? So it's, it's, it's mad, isn't it? It's, yeah. In the world of antiques, it's worth 200, 250 quid. That's yeah. its market. But to make it new, you reckon eight, 900 quid? Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? It is. So how do you get that shape? Because when I look at that, it blows my mind. I mean, eight, 900 quid to you, you'd have to pay me a million quid to even attempt it and I wouldn't be able to do it. it well, it's easy, because I mean, all, this would have all been 
straight pieces of wood. Yes. Originally. Yeah. So it's it's knowing it's knowing what shape to put on the wood, and then yeah. when you put it together, and you, in these days, it wouldn't be steam bending; it'd be fire bending. So you'd have a little fire inside it, wet the timber through, so it made its own steam, right? To bend it into shape. Yeah. And it's just knowing where to bend it now, because if you look at it, it's got a nice little curve to here. Yeah. And then from here, straight. Right. So it's knowing how to put that bit on to get that curve. Yeah. And then how how to take it off so you get a nice flat piece here. And and it's always oak, is it, in this country? Yes. Right. Why? Know it, because we had plenty of it, didn't we? Well, fine. Fair enough. And it's a hard wood. And yeah. It's going to last a very long time. And then, uh, you know, we breweries over here tried chestnut like the like the wine companies did, but yeah. chestnut never took off over here. Whereas right. it took, you know, you do get a bit of chestnut in among the wine. Okay. So this this is definitely an oak. Yeah. As I thought. Yeah. Uh, and what else do you do here then? Do you repair casks for people? Yeah, we repair. Yeah. We remake, which is taking casks down, larger casks, making them into smaller casks. Yeah. So in beer terms, in the old days, smaller breweries, you know, like your little independents that just had 20, 30 pubs. Yeah. They'd make new hogsheads. What's a hogshead? 54 gallon cask. Right. That would last 80 years. Wow. And then the older end of the oxides, so the ones that were 80 years old, yeah. you can knock it all apart, saw the ends off, rejoint it, and you can make a 36 gallon cask, which is a barrel. So that's just reducing the yeah. height, yeah. And that, the 36 would last for 25, 30 years. After that, you can reduce it to an 18 gallon cask. That's bonkers. Another 18 you can turn into a nine, a nine you can turn into a four and a half. So you're going to get 200 years out of it. Yeah, cask. and then when you fin four and a half are finished, you take all the best pieces out and make a miniature cask. <laughs> stand on your mantle thing? as you stand on your mantelpiece with your best malting. Well, isn't that fantastic? Yeah, oh, and, and it, they are beautifully environmentally friendly. Yeah. These things. Yeah. Now that collection there. Yeah. W what's the story? You haven't made those. No, we bought them from uh, Bardstown in Kentucky. From from America. Yeah. So that's a selection of uh, bourbon casts from different bourbon distillers. And what will you do with them? We'll repair them up, and then once they're repaired up, so they get repaired, so they'll have stripes right down each joint, all the hoops will be set into the oh, right so place. they'll be resealed. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be reworked, redone, repaired, and then they'll go out for £130 a piece. Well, that sounds cheap to me. It's, it is cheap. Because think, if I made that brand new out of brand new oak, yeah. you're looking at about 780 quid. Wow. So they just keep getting recycled yeah. continually. Well, that's what Coopers, the Coopers are, are the original recyclers. I suppose they are, aren't they? Yeah. Because even the hoop iron, as you come down from the bigger cast, you cut it down and use the hoop iron as you go along. So nothing is wasted. Nothing's is wasted. It? Yeah. And how come the Americans don't just reuse those things? Because they've, they've got a thing in the States that says that bourbon can be only used, put into cask ones. So they're not that old then? No. They're probably about six years old at the oldest but what why is there a law in america saying they can only use them once protecting the cooperage industry isn't it oh gosh so looking after their industry well doesn't that make sense it doesn't does. it so every four years a, a bourbon distiller has to introduce brand new casks a bourbon distillers there's just casks in bourbon distilleries there's casks going in and out all day long and so the defunct ones which by law they're not allowed to reuse get sold to the what to the Scots? They go to the Scots whiskey industry. They go down for to Mexico for tequila. Wow. They go to the Caribbean for rum. And and because they've had bourbon in, it adds to the flavour. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Actually, it's a very environmentally friendly business. It is. And how long can you trace back the art of coopering? Because you you love your history, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, I knew you did. So how how far back can you trace the art of coopering in Britain? In Britain. Yeah. It, there is there is a bit before Roman times, right? But it was done, practiced, but the main of it, and how it's done now, was brought by the Romans, who obviously had nicked it off the Egyptians and ah. just perfected it a bit better. And yeah, but I mean, I went to Japan and met a Jap Cooper in Japan for yeah. a television program out there, and he was saying that the tribe that took it to Japan had learnt it off the Romans. Wow. So even Cooper in Japan's done the same way that we do. Well, it's done a little bit different because they're pulled towards instead of push away. But it's on the same principles that the Romans 
taught everybody. So the Romans were, were master knickers because yeah. they nicked all the best bits from other cultures and yeah. reinvented it and made it better, Correct. didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, you thank the Romans <laughs> for things like this. Yeah, definitely. It's adding great history to it. It is. Okay, that's really interesting. So worth 250 quid in the antiques business to make it new, not far off a grand. Not far off a grand. Amazing. Can you show me some of the techniques you employ? Yeah, of course you can. Now this will give you an idea of just what kind of work is involved. So go for it, Alistair. Tell us what you're doing. Well, we're going to make the staves, which is the side of the body. So the that, these are the straps. These not are the straps. The, 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 what do you call them? The staves. The, the staves. sides. The bits of wood. Right. So we just use straight, straight planks of timber. Yeah. And the first implement we use is a cooper's axe. Wow. But just to show you, I bought these two axes together in 1979, and they both had the same amount of steel on. You're joking. So it's no. just been shaved, or it's been knocked off, worn away. Worn away, ground away. Wow. And the, the idea with the axes, depending what shape you want on your barrel, yeah. you roughly find the centre, but with the jugs it'd be a bit lower of the centre, but because these have been made for barrels, we find the centre. Yeah. And we just literally stick the axe in, and we just shape the staves off. You see, that's the time-consuming thing. There's yeah. no, so there's no cutting machine here. So that's all no, done by it. hand. So what we end up with. Yeah, got you. You see the shape. Oh, I see. There's, can I just have a look at that? So there you go. So that is the shape then of the barrel. Yeah. Clever stuff. So what you've got to do, when you're chopping it, what you've got to look with for your eye and your hands. Yeah. Is you've got to see what, what width it is across the top. Yeah. And what width it is in the belly. Now, how long would it take for, to train somebody to be able to get that eye-hand measuring coordination? Well, it's, it's over a four-year period. Right. And making new casks is the last part of it. Right. So you start with making hoops. Yeah. What are the hoops? The straps that sit, fit round them. Okay. So you start with doing them. Yeah. Then you go on to finishing repairs. Then you learn to repair. Right. And you learn to remake. Got you. And then learn to make new ones, so it's a progress. So okay. it's all bits and pieces. So, so, so making a new one is the hardest part, yeah. right? Yeah, because there's so much to. Because you can, you've only got to be a thirty second of an inch out here. Yeah. And it puts a whole different shape onto it. Well, that would be ruination, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would. So once, let's say, once we've got the flat pieces. Yeah. The next bit is we use knives like that. You see. Great looking bits of kit, aren't they? And that goes in. Careful there, Alistair. No, it does do dodgy to me. No, no. <laughs> That's why the belly. We <laughs> stop at the belly. <laughs> and, and, that, and these tools are very traditional. I mean, they yeah. look medieval to me. Yeah. And then just to back round the outsides, which shows a. Unbelievable. That's why I wear a nice thick apron, you see. Have you ever cut yourself there? No, the only time I've cut myself was working at a brewery in Wiltshire. Yeah. And we had some oak and it was hard and I come out of a really hard piece into a soft piece on oh. a head for a 20 litre cask and put the knife in right across there. Jeepers. Come out that quick. It didn't bleed though, because it was a nice clean cut. <laughs> bit of a bonus then. But yeah, I mean, all the, t all the tools is, I mean, all these knives, all the steel on them is made by William Greaves, Where Chief Works Sheffield. Nice, well Sheffield steel. They were taken over in, 1998, in 1898 by Thomas Turton and Cut Sons. So you can date these to pre that date? Well Turton's carried on making them to about 1920. Oh I see, so, and, and how old do you think these are? I think they're probably about 18, 18, late 1890s, 1900. Now you see, you must appreciate that because you make things that will last for centuries. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about today's modern throwaway society? I don't ask the question. Well, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's horrible, isn't it? I mean, the whole, the whole thing about cask making is to make new casks, you know they're gonna have a life expectancy of 80 years. Yeah, and then they can be recycled. They can, and that's what, Cooper, that's what Coopering's always been about, recycling. Yeah. Like I say, so when you get to the smallest cask, which is 20 litres, yeah. you know, for commercial, 
once you get to that, you can take all the best bits out of the centre and make yourself a nice little miniature cast to sand on your mantel piece for your best malting. Beautiful. You are an eco warrior, Alistair. That's not, what you are. Not that I don't, I'm not. I'm just a I'm just a bloke that does a job that. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know it. You see, that's what you are now. You can put yeah. that on your website. Yeah. <laughs> also an eco warrior. Yeah. So once the staves are being being dressed off with the axe because they're a bit rough. We've got a nice long wooden plane that we actually put the joints on this, the angles on the side. Okay, let's see you do that. Right here. The next part yeah. is to joint the staves. We use this long wooden plane. Right. Which is slightly hollowed here so that when you go yeah. over the belly, it rolls over nicely without rolling the joint. Right. Well, I bought this one and there's this one with a straight flat bed. Yeah. I bought them off of Cooper in Tetley's in 1979. Is this when you started in 79? 79, yeah, okay. when I started. Yeah. Right. And we were lucky that when I, when I started, we had about six weeks of going backwards and forwards to Tetley's in Leeds buying their wooden casks because they were just coming out of wood. Right. And I bought off a of Cooper there, I bought these two planes and he said they'd been in his family for 200 years. Oh. So, so now they're 240 years old, at least. At least. And are they still doing the job as well today as they did 240 years ago? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, they're probably doing it better now because they've got some wear. <laughs> well, yeah, and you can see where the wear is as well. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, that's generations of use, isn't it? That's what I'm saying, a genuine antique, and I'm using, abusing it every day. Yeah. No, you're making it better, <laughs> Alistair. And that's the great thing with antiques, in actual fact, that the more you use them, actually, the better they get. They do. You, you can use and abuse. They're bomb-proof, generally. Yeah, of course, yeah. Because, Alistair, you'll appreciate this, and I do, that they were made to last forever yeah. before this new invention of making things to last for five or 10 years. Let's say in the 19th century, the height of the industrial revolution, yeah. this idea never entered anyone's head. If well, you made got, something. That's why we've got so many good steam engines still about. Have you got steam engines? No, but I say that's why there's so many good oh, steam yes, engines. Oh yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, just that I'm actually handling a steam engine for a client oh, now, right. I was gonna try and sell it to you. No. <laughs> you don't fancy a steam engine, do you? No. I might know somebody that does. <laughs> well, well, we'll chat about that <laughs> later. Right, show us this then. So you start either side and you just, you see that fits, you make the legs so it fits in your groin so you're comfortable. And you go. Right. So are you saying that's really fit to, to you, really? Because if you were, you know, shorter or taller, yeah, would you, you just, then... Just get, get, make You'd make one I've, bit I've, I've cut a piece off the legs because it come off a it come off a longer Cooper, right? So I've actually cut three inch off the bottom of the legs. So this bit of kit is made to fit your body. Yeah. So anybody, Fantastic. any next person that gets it from me, if they're taller than me or shorter than me, they'll have to adjust. They're it. shorter. They're all right. They can adjust the legs. Yeah. If they're taller, they'll just have make to make a new set of legs, and it just fits you. It's remarkable. And it's just it's just so easy. And what about the putting together of the cast? Can you show me an yeah, idea of that? We can. By God, you are prepared, aren't you? I am. Blue Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Were you a big Blue Peter fan as a I kid? Was. Yeah, but <laughs> when, we, when I was an apprentice, we had to do brewery tours on a night. Yeah. And my, when we were going home from work on the evening, my old boss used to say, don't forget you've got a Blue Peter tonight. <laughs> what, to show people how things were yeah, put together? so we had casts in all different stages. Oh, brilliant. So we called it the Blue Peter because we whizzed round it in 20 minutes. Oh, brilliant. Okay, well, this is Blue Peter for adults. Okay, go <laughs> yeah. on, show us then. So what we're going to do now, we're going to raise one. And these are a, these are a new size casts. So we've made, made a new raise hoop. Right, now, a raise hoop. And when you say raise, is that build it up? Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to raise the cask up. Build it, build it build up. Build it up. Yeah. So we just, you see the staves are already, yeah. what I've done, say a bit earlier, a bit Blue Peter. Yeah. So we take the first one and we just mix and match and go around. We actually, uh, in 1990, we did, uh, we went around a few pubs in Yorkshire doing this and uh, letting people have a pound a go to do it. Oh. And raised a bit of money for the old ITV telephone. Do you remember then? Oh, I do, I do. And could anybody do it? Yeah. Could they? M mostly women. Oh, isn't that strange? Yeah, because it was because we were doing it in the pub when I had, had a drink or two. <laughs> Lads got a bit leery. So uh, yeah, but women women actually st studied it. Lads ah. didn't. They just went, ah, oh, that looks easy. I can do that. Yeah. Anybody can do that. But you say, girls, just watch what we're going on. Just yeah, it was a good bit of fun actually. We got we got all round 
we've got our round Yorkshire doing it and got to uh, ITV Studios, we had Mr Wakely doing it. Oh brilliant. I tell you what, being a Cooper does not get you places. You've been to Japan. America. R yeah. I had, uh, in 1991, when we were working for Scottish Newcastle Breweries, we went out and did a Renaissance Fair in the uh, Black Point Forest in Novato, California. Wow. So we had a fortnight out there doing that. And then, uh, so, yeah, just here, there and everywhere. Met all sorts of nice people. Couple of couple of jobs on the repair shop. Ah, oh, there you go, brilliant. Then I get to meet nice people like you. Ah, oh, well. So yeah, see. so it's 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 that it's actually nice being a Cooper. And it's then you get all you get all the nice, lovely cus because we're uh, we're not aiming to be a big commercial cooperage. We want to do the do it as it used to be done. Yeah. So we uh, we we're actually going to have customers come and they can pick their own cast so they can have a look at their own cast being made and, and see the job being done properly. And so over time, and I mean a very long period of time and great skill, the barrel begins to take shape and eventually it looks like this. I mean, it's quite a process. Is this the final stage? This, this, this is, it's been on the fire, it's been bent, we've put some hoops on it. Right. This is being finished one end, but it's to finish off on this on this top end. Yeah. So we use old fashioned tools. I mean, because it's a whiskey cask and it's charred inside. So when you say it's been on the fire, we, obviously we can't see that because you no. haven't got a fire going no. today. But how does that we have, work? We have little bra we have little braziers, one for different sizes for different size casks. We put a live fire inside them. Right. We keep the cask nice and wet. Yeah. It sits in a pool of water on the floor. <laughs> it's got to do <laughs> yeah because it's right being being ex firefight being ex retained firefighter i'm yeah i'm fighting that i set my tools on fire yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i don't want to lose them but yeah so what we do is we, we fire bend them so they're right. a mixture of fire and water yeah it's a steam and heat yeah yeah bend them into shape right we then once they're bent we put the hoop put the finishing hoops on which are made on the anvil at the back of you right so yeah we make, all the hoops are made for so you each make of, everything here yeah all the hoops are made for each individual cask it goes back on the fire and then it's toasted wow okay with, with the hoops on yeah yeah so it's toasted so they get a light there's a light toast a medium toast a heavy toast oh come on this sounds like a breakfast order at a hotel if, if you go if you go into the wine industry yeah and you talk about wine toasts yeah You've got somewhere in the region of 20 different toasts because you get a light light, yeah. a light medium, a light heavy, God. a medium light. It's much more complicated than it I is. thought. It is. A lot complicated. Yeah. So, and especially in spirits now, they've gone into the spirits used to be, the cast used to be bent, chucked on the fire and just charred. Right. That was it. Okay. But now they want toast because of different caramels and different complexities of the timber given different flavours. So who are you making this for? This is for Forest Distillery, Forest Gin, yeah. in Cheshire. Yeah. And they've ordered eight 64 litre casks. Right. Because they're still running 64 litres, so they'll make 64 litres in one run that is into beautiful. the cask. I mean, it really is genuinely a piece of art. So t tell, me, tell me what is the process now then? So it's been through all the firing and the bending and the steaming we'll and take, all of that. We'll take the hoop off the top and put one just that sits about a quarter of an inch below the end of the cask. Yeah. We then got a bent plane called the topping plane we go around the top the ends off yeah and that's important that that runs level to within two thousandths of an inch oh this is madness because the groove that you're going to put into it if it's more than two thousandths of an inch out the groove will be out and then the cask lid won't seal in it so it won't so the cask pointless will then isn't it yeah. okay sh show me what you're going to do you want me to show you yeah right have we got time yeah have you got yeah. time I've i got think time. we've got time let's do it yeah so that comes off right so that's been the thing that's held the body in, in shape. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the end loop that's going to... And this is now the permanent ring that will stay no, there. No, this is a working hoop. This is, called, a... this is what we call a catch hoop. Okay. So... You see, it just gives you a loud... So, so that's you... just holding it in place. What's that? That's a topping plane. Or a sump, we call them topping planes. Sump plane. Yeah. 
So you see the nice curve on it, you get right left handed. Yeah. And that goes. And you see how you're gripping it between yeah. your knees. You can see how now a big thick apron's and it vital yeah. piece of protection equipment for a Cooper. I, I mean, I knew that it was going to be a physical job, but it's much more than physical. It's literally your body is helping shape yeah. the barrels. So your body shape, your yeah, size right. and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it, it's yeah. all part of what makes a barrel. So a Cooper really is part of the barrel. He is. I tell you what, this is really genuinely, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, watching at home, that it gives me a real appreciation, I think you too as well, of what goes into making these things. You see, the topping plane was 100 years old when I bought it. Again, and it'll be here Long in 100 after years' time. Yeah. So once we've we used the short-handled ads. Yeah. Well, that's an ancient tool, isn't it? I it mean, is. it's medieval and before. Wow. Yeah. And this is going to do what? Now, what are you going to do now? Okay, what am I going to do now? We're going to shape the ends of the staves. So, all the work's done against the block. Yeah. And then we find a bung stave, or the stave that's going to have a filling hole in. It's all very confusing to me, but fascinating. So you're making like a chamfer, like an angled... Yeah. an amphored chamfer. We're also watching it, it runs round nice and level. Do you want to have a go? Yeah, I'd love to have a go, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So I'll just pop it up there. Yeah. Put your hand there. Okay. And sweep, just sweep. Just sweep. So just literally sweep? Yeah. <laughs> I'm ruining your barrel. No, you're right. you can't ruin it, not yet. You can't, really? Not yet, no. i tell you what. It's not only power, strength, and skill. There's an artistry to this. Yeah. I mean, you're effectively sculpting this thing. Yeah. The best way to use these. Yeah. Is take it as you're going to share share cans. Yeah. With your thumb on top. Yeah. And then nice loose wrist. So it's almost like holding a, a golf club. Yeah. Nice yeah. loose wrist. That's amazing. Yeah. Michelangelo. So, yeah. So once we've we've done that sort of thing, we use. A chiv that rounds the top two inch of the cask off, and that again, same principle again. So complicated against the block. In so it rounds the top two inch off, and then to put the rebate in the groove. Oh, Alistair, seriously, you've lost me now. I mean, that's, that's genuinely, a, that's a cross. C R O Z E. Right. Well, that looks like a medieval torture, something or other. It is. So there's a set distance from there to there. And it's set because we've done the other end. And then that goes in. Bonkers, that cuts, isn't it? That cuts a rebate, that cuts a rebate where, the, where the lids fit. Okay, let me stop you there because seriously, I mean, I'm fascinated by it, but you've lost me because it's so complicated. Yeah. Much more complicated than I ever believed. Let me just bring this back in. So everything that you've just shown me been and done with what that. has been done with that. Yeah. Except you've got to think when the group, when that was chived down there, adds and chived, it couldn't be done at a block like that. Why not? Because it's too small. Right. So, so would it, it be more difficult? Yeah. That's why it takes longer. Wow. The smaller you get, you get to 20, I mean, 40 litres and 20 litre casts are hard because they're so small. Yeah. But then when you get under 20 litres, because they're even smaller again, you can't, we've got things adapted so we can make them casks wow. against, against this, the 20 so litres. it's harder to make something yeah. smaller than it is bigger. Yeah, takes longer. I By the time it took me to make that, if I'm making the 200 litre casks that yeah. were from Kentucky, yeah. I could make three of them in the time it takes me to make one of them. Fantastic. I think that's the perfect out, as we say in the world of TV, Alistair. Yeah. It's been an absolute learning process and a delight. Thank it's you very much. It's been an absolute much. pleasure. Great to see you. I'll Good see you see again. You. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you very much. So there you have it. That's how you make a barrel. So massive thanks to Alistair Sims, Master Cooper at Jensen's Cooperage in Ripon, 
North Yorkshire. Until next time, I'm David Harper. Cheerio.